Hey, welcome back to The Dive. Today on the show, we have the president and CEO of Arctic Star Exploration, Pat Power. He's going to answer some of our questions about inflation impacting the diamond industry, what he thinks will bring investors back to the mining space, his read on the current diamond market, and he's going to give us an update on Arctic Star from the latest drill results to what the company is doing differently from others in the past, And he's going to give us the company's strategy for exploration going into 2023. Hey, Pat, welcome to The Dive. Thank you, Cassandra. Nice to be here. Okay, so let's start off with a little macro. Everyone's talking about inflation. How closely are you following the inflation data? And do you think that it has any impact on the diamond industry? Um, well, it's hard to say. I mean, inflation is a, a negative thing for the general population usually. And so I think the diamond world really, um, a big part of its uh, luster is, is engagement rings. So that, that becomes a little harder for people if inflation gets too carried away. So it will probably have some kind of effect on, on the diamond world. Now, according to Care Edge Ratings, Diamond jewelry reached an all-time high of $87 billion as of last month. What is your read on the current diamond market? Well, the current diamond market is excellent. For rough diamonds, which we are, you know, we're involved in, there's less producers of diamonds. There's a big demand for diamonds. So just in that scenario right there, it's it's a very positive space to be in right now for us. Um, it's one of the weirdest things because there's, there's a, it's a multifold event that's happening right now. Diamonds are trading at their highest value within five or 7% of their highest value ever. So that's a great space to be in. If you could choose a space to be in, that's the space you'd want to be in. Uh, we have very few, if any competitors out there, which is another great space to be in. But the downside of that is we don't have a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge about this anymore. So that's the hard part. So investors really haven't seen success because there's no other companies to see success with. I.e., if you were in gold, you could have made a a bunch of money on this company and you put it into that company because you understand the gold scenarios. Um, Gold is a far greater thing and it it lives and breathes a lot easier because of that. In in the diamond space, it's very difficult because of of the lack of knowledge. And uh, back in the 90s, when it was a very big thing in Canada, there were so many companies involved and so many people were making money on different fronts and they'd move money from this front to that front, but they all understood why they were doing it. And now they don't. And it's just, it's re-education for the most part on our part, which is hard to do. Some have argued that gold companies should start holding on to mined gold in an attempt to put pressure on the price at metals exchanges. Do you think that this strategy would be applicable to diamonds? Well, yes, that's that's a possibility. It's a possibility. Uh, I mean, we haven't delved into that as much, but yeah, that's been talked about by a lot of people and that's a, a real possibility out there. So that would be a positive for our industry. What do you think will bring investors back to the mining sector and specifically diamonds? Well, success is what the investor needs to have a win sooner or later in something. And that's that's what has to happen. Um, th- that's happening in, in other uh, commodities right now. So I say that people are, it's a different generation now. There's a lot of tech young people out there and that's that's a, a, an audience that's harder to reach sometimes. But they, they understand that, you know, you don't get in a car unless you have metal to make your car to get into. Um, that kind of th- scenario is real and that's, that's never, it's never going to go away. It's only getting actually more dynamic because there's more people on the planet. I think the planet's uh, population just ticked over 8 billion people. So that means there's more of everything to make and that comes out of metal and that's a reality. It's not even, uh, you can't get around that. So I think that's always going to do well for the mining sector. Okay. Now let's talk about Arctic star. You recently published caustic fusion diamond results from the drill testing at the Sequoia Kimberlite complex at the Diagra project. Yep. Can you walk us through the results? Sure. So what we're trying to like it, Sequoia is really interesting in in numerous ways. Starting off with it sits beside two of the largest mines uh, in the world, which is uh, Divik and Akati. Akati being the first diamond mine up in the territories uh, that was built in the 90s uh, by Diamet and BHP. 
it's produced over $20 billion worth of diamonds, as has Divic as well. So you got 40 to $50 billion worth of diamonds coming out of two mines since the late 90s. So it's a very prolific thing. And for a population up there that's between 40 and 60,000 people for the entire territories, it, it consumes a lot of jobs. So it's a big thing for the Northwest Territories government and the people in general. We are sitting right beside infrastructure, which is unusual in the far north. We've got two mines within 27 to 35 kilometers away from us. So we have the ability to get our product to one of those if we can put together a deal. The results we had are from a, a timber lake called Sequoia that was hit two years ago. Uh, we discovered it two years ago. It has some really curious things about it. Uh, one of them is probably the largest intrusion. So it's the largest pipe up in the bull territories. And when you're talking pipes, you want to, you want tonnage. So that's a positive. It's a very, very big complex. Um, Buddy, who is our, our director and head, vice president of, of of exploration. Um, he, you know, it's probably the largest pipe ever hit up in the territory. So that's a positive. It's got really good and interesting chemistry. So we'd rely a lot upon chemistry because chemistry tells us how we should expect to see the diamonds and what the quality should be and the, um, just different, different indications. The chemistry is super important. So this chemistry really resembles a few mines around the world that produce very large, clear white diamonds. Those diamonds come from deeper, way down deeper in the mantle. Usually the, the diamond stability feels about 180 to 200 Ks down. These diamonds are coming from 600 Ks down. Now in transportation to the surface, because they're coming so far, they, they don't have any impurities and the real lousy diamonds get kind of beaten up and they, they're gone before they make it to the surface where we can mine them. So you get a really high proportion of clear white diamonds, which is what we're getting. Nitrogen free, which is free of all kind of anything other than carbon, which is what diamonds are. And usually all white. And we're getting that chemistry. We're getting the results we just saw a few weeks ago are clear white diamonds. 98% were clear white. That's really, really, really unusual around the planet. Those two big mines right next door to us, uh, Buddy Doyle found, he was a, led the team that found Divic back in the 90s when he was with Rio Tinto. I believe A154 South, which is the most prolific pipe in the entire territories, I think what it started producing was 4.8 carats a ton, which is very, very good. That had about 30% clear whites. The rest were off colors and bored. This is hitting about 98% clear white diamonds. So that's a huge positive. People haven't really picked up on that yet, but it is a big, big thing because it allows us to have a smaller carrots per ton. Our diamond price should be better based on that kind of philosophy, having clear whites. So that it was a really good result. It was slightly less than the year previous, the, the drill results. We had uh, about one diamond per kilogram, which is excellent, but we that's what we had two years ago. We're batting about half a diamond Per kilo this time. So we've dropped off there, but all the clear white diamonds, the percentage maintained. So we know we're dealing at this point and we've only drilled 200 meters of the thousand. So we have a lot more to do here, but it's being consistent and that's important because an intrusion is large. It might be multi-phased. You might see different things. So far we've seen exactly what we saw last year and that's what we wanted to do. So it's been a real positive that way. Um, people were expecting this to find, they just hoped we'd find like a two carat diamond in the drill core. Now you think about this, <laughs> I always tell people it's a kilometer long, <clears throat> 250 to 300 meters wide, and you're putting a pin in it. So your, your, your sample is so small. All we need to do is see micro diamond counts. That gives us the idea of projection to bigger diamond space or it doesn't, but it gives us the understanding of what we're doing. And so far, everything is pointing in the proper direction for Sequoia. A lot more work is needed to be done. That is true, but it looks really positive so far. Now, we hate asking management questions like this, but given the strong results, it seems odd that the share price hasn't responded. Why do you well, think that the stock has performed so poorly so far? Um, mostly because I think people think we have 203 million shares outstanding. We have to raise more money for sure next year to, to put the programs in place. So they're thinking dilution. We have a short window of working 
for drilling in particular, it's usually from March 31st to maybe if we're lucky, June 1st because of the ice. So that's a big thing. And people just say, you know, I'll buy you later. They did that last year. The same thing happened last year with really good results. They just, they bailed and they came back in later. So that's, I think, a big philosophy. We're at year end right now. So tax loss selling is a big thing for us because we're, we're trading not that well. So that's been a, a part of our world and had a lot of people just sell, you know, they'll buy back in the new year. So that's being part of it as well. But the results themselves are excellent. It's just, it's, it's all the, the, the noise around it that's causing this problem, we believe. Because we don't, we like, we know diamonds. We are the best that we do in this industry. That's a good result. It's just time frame is, is a little quirky and, and people have made assumptions that we're going to roll back, which we're not, we don't, that's not something we want to do. Like it hurts everybody, including ourselves, mostly ourselves. So that, those kind of discussions have been all over the place. And it's, it's kind of like, as I said, it's a noise around the reality. It was a really good result. So that's my opinion on that. <laughs> okay. So in October, you reported diamond indicator mineral analysis and classification from the mm -hmm. Arbutus Kimberlite discovery. Yep. Why are indicator minerals important? And what does this tell us? Well, diamonds are very rare. So within a kimberlite, diamonds are still extremely rare. What's less rare are the things that grow at the same temperature and depth as diamonds. And often they are the inclusions within the diamond and they touch the diamond. So you, you're, they're plentiful. So when you get the right composition of these indicator minerals, you know the growth of the diamond either immediately around them or if they're the inclusion in the diamond, you know, you can tell we're going to have good diamonds, bad diamonds, or no diamonds. If your chemistry is 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 disproportionate in some of the, the the things that make up the chemistry, you know you're probably not in the right environment to have diamond growth. So chemistry is everything. Chemistry is diamonds. It's 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 the brother. It's the kin. Um, it's it's the pathway to find diamonds. And they're as I said, they're much more plentiful, and that's a really important thing. Uh, finding diamonds is is super rare in core. Like it, it, like people like want you to split core and say, oh, there we go. There's a four carat diamond. But that's happened like twice in the history that we know. I mean, it's very, very rare. So those are the super important thing. And when you get past that, so when you start getting the diamonds, then they become less important because now you have the thing you're looking for and then you start feeding off that, which we're doing right now. So the indicators told us to do what we're, we we're supposed to do, which is drill in this location for this and that. And they've, the results have given us the the, the confidence to keep on going to, to it's going to develop an ore body here. So that's what we're doing now. But indicators are super important in the beginning, less important at the very end. Okay. Now we have a question from a viewer from one of your last interviews. Yep. What are you doing differently from De Beers that's enabling you to spot Kimberlites? <laughs> okay. So great question. Big story behind that. So De Beers in their history, pretty well developed the diamond market. They were a monopoly, like a real monopoly. They weren't allowed to go to certain countries because they were a monopoly. So we're a junior company. When they went up to Lac de Bras, they had the third largest property besides BHP and Rio Tinto. They have very good exploration people. They did a great job. They found 25 kimberlites on this property, mostly all magnetic kimberlites. Now, Buddy has a theory through finding many, many kimberlites up there. He's, his numbers are over a hundred. Like he's got the most kimberlites in that whole field than any person existing. So he's a really, wow. he, he's a data guy, right? He's a really, really smart man. He just said to himself, we were all hitting these mag lows. Everyone was hitting mag lows. They were everywhere. You could see them, you hit them, but they weren't turning out to be in the mine plan. So there were kimberlites, they had diamonds, but they weren't good enough. There weren't enough of them to develop a mine around those particular pipes. So he said to himself, like, I, I need to think of other things that I could see these with, and there's other geophysical tools that could use. So we started using EM a lot and gravity a lot. And they're just, you know, all geophysics are is looking at contrast between something and something. Magnetics are just more magnetite or less magnetite. Uh, gravity is more dense or less dense. Uh, EM is resistive, conductive, or, or resistive. So he started, 
he had all these pipes for Rio Tinto. So he picked 20 of the ones that didn't make a mine plan. He did these big, big ground grids, like way larger than usual, like 10 times larger than usual. And then he did all these processes over the known kimberlites that were all mag maglows. And lo and behold, he found 20 more kimberlites. And the real interesting part about this and what he's really said that made all this project happen was every single one of the non-magnetic kimberlites had better diamonds than its sister pipe. So all the original pipes that were hit mag lows, because mag is a destructive to diamond process. It, it involves oxidation and heat, and heat is negative. So what happens on a lot of these strongly magnetic targets is they resorb the diamond. So they either pockmark the diamonds or the diamonds actually resorb back to carbon. So you have, in some cases, zero diamonds. You could have had them as they were coming up, but in the wrong circumstance, they get too hot, they don't cool quick enough, and they resorb. So what we were talking about to make it black and white is we said, we want non-resorbed pipes. So we don't want magnetic pipes. We want non-magnetic pipes. And that's what the premise was here. De Beers hit 25 pipes. None of them could make a mine. So they were losing budget and expiration, especially in this area because they weren't successful. BHP had a mine. The Rio Tinto people had a mine, but not De Beers. So when they dropped this property after 20 some odd years, we picked it up. So it, it was in their possession forever. And you got to remember that they're, they control the diamond market, especially at earlier years. They controlled it very, very closely. So they don't want people, if they're not successful, they certainly don't want people to be successful behind them. And there's a history of that in the world. Like a lot of things that have happened in the world are where De Beers has been. They walked away from it. Someone's come in there and done the work and produced it. So that's no one. That's happened. It's happened in the Lac de Gras already. Gaucho came from De Beers. They dropped two pipes. The Mount Province directorship picked it up. And there's four years later, there's a mine. Because they don't, if they're not successful and they lose budget and everyone loses budget, it's a scary thing when you're, when you're putting million dollar holes down and not being successful. They walked away. They didn't put, they didn't put all the information and assessment work. So usually a regular company in Canada, when you do work, you follow your work with the government and that gives you more time with the property or you follow your work and you don't, you know, time runs out and years go by and then but you see the work that was done. They didn't put their information in assessment. So that also triggers you to believe they could have been close, but they just don't want anyone to know what they were doing. So we followed up. We did the same thing that Buddy did back in his day with Rio Cento. We did these mega large grids around known kimberlites that were mag lows. And we found in the first year, five more pipes, including Sequoia. So that's the kind of philosophy we're carrying forward. That's why, I mean, we love going to where De, Beer, De Beers was because they're smart people. They're, they're good on the macro sense. They're wonderful diamond people. On the micro sense, they're good at getting you to the areas that are, could be very productive. But when it gets down to the really micro sense of doing the work on the ground, they get muddled up a little bit, <laughs> in my opinion. And they've, it's, if there's a history of that, you can point out many examples of that. Anyways, we're capitalizing on that. It's worked really well. And, you know, there's a saying out there, you find mines in the shadow of the head frames of other mines. And that's, it's because the geology exists to be successful. That's where we are. That's what we're doing. That's what we're proving right now. We know that you have other projects. Do you care to share your strategy for exploration? What can you tell us at this point? Uh, we've got one other project that we're kind of keen on. We have been for years since Finland. It's on the... Uh, Carillion Craton, it's right next, well, I wouldn't say right next, but it's difficult right now because it's right in the Russian border. So we're kind of hesitant to to move forward. And, and real economics are that we are really focusing on Diagra right now. That takes a lot of money and it takes a lot of our time and energy and we're a small company. But that's a really nice project. It's got really good results. The one thing we're challenged with right now is the intrusions are small. As where we're talking about a thousand meter sequoia, we're talking about a thirty to fifty meter pipe in Finland. Really good diamond results, but just very small. So we have to, in the near future, we're going to re-examine how uh, we're going to probably do some geophysics, airborne geophysics, to see if we can find any larger intrusions because the diamond counts are really nice. 
just the tonnage problem was existing. So that's needs more work, but we're excited. So the, one of the two projects we have, and that's one to keep it. What does the planning and budgeting look like for your 2023 program? Well, we're, that's what we're underway in the next week and a half with Buddy and myself looking at what we want to do and how to achieve that and how to get the financing in uh, with doing as little dilution as possible. We have some ideas, but it's probably best to be shared after we have these discussions. Okay, so we'll stay tuned. We'll have to have you back. Well, uh, okay. thank you so much for coming on today and uh, telling your story with us, Pat. Oh, well, thanks for having me. And take care. Have a Merry Christmas. Thank you so much for watching today. We'll be back again tomorrow with another great interview. So be sure to hit that little bell on your way out and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.